next uh, speaker and the last speaker for this morning is uh, Tobias Revel. Um, he's a critical designer and futurist. He's, uh, among many other things, uh, a tutor at the Royal College of Arts at the London College of Communication and a researcher at the Arab Foresight Group. Um, his talk is called uh, Design Conflict Territories, and I won't say much more about it because I think the title is both very clear and kind of intriguing, so okay. I'll let you talk. <laughs> uh, hello. Um, my computer is, is fried. It's run up against its four-year planned obsolescence. <laughs> Thanks, Apple, very much. Um, so I'm, uh, I was invited to talk about Design Conflict Territories, which was, um, was the title of an essay I wrote uh, just over a year ago after the end of uh, the incredible Urban IXD summer school, some of who are here in the audience today. Can I get a whoop? Yeah, all right. <laughs> um, and I, I, was, I was concerned, as, as, as said, I'm a critical designer, which, which uh, is very great and very cool and everything, but has its flaws in that a lot of people wonder what the hell it's actually doing and what it's for as a field. Um, and so I, I wrote this essay where I sort of speculated on a lot of the failings that I saw of the field and the failings I saw of our relationship with technology in general and then sort of speculated a proposal about what the next um, step might be. And over the last year, I've come to realize that that proposal is, is pretty much impossible um, and it's unachievable. I'm going to describe what it is. So the point is design conflict territories... Uh, functions as a kind of negative space around which you can map other things that are happening. It's a bit like a unicorn in the sense that it doesn't exist, but we can identify characteristics of other technological and social uh, paradigms and then place them next to it and say, this is perhaps what's missing. This is the gap in the middle. Um, and I've also, sp I'm a practicing designer, so I don't, I don't just do theory. I produce uh, works and things. So I, uh, you know, <laughs> full design. Um, so I did uh, a series of films that have been spun off this research, and I've done, uh, I've done a website as well, which I'll, I'll quickly show as, as well. So there's a couple of things that have sort of spun off it, and at this stage I'm kind of moving on to the next thing in terms of like iterating it again and mo moving up. So this talk and, and some of the stuff I'm going to talk about is part of that process. Um, this is, is perhaps the central quote of the essay, which I'm just going to um, sh uh, show. You can check out the essay. It's on my blog. It's, it's quite easy to find. Uh, while we were talking, Google very, very gradually built a future around us and um, replaced Google with whoever or whatever satisfies your own biases. The point stands that the entities constructing and steering our futures are often what they like to call the future, with all the baggage of powerlessness and inevitability that that wording brings aren't states, and they work on completely different geopolitical strata. There is no town square for Google. Fundamentally, the, 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 the point is that we've lost a, a commons because of the, the way that we interact with technology and with the way that it's become, it's muted our political agency in society. Um, and so it, I, I propose what a new sort of commons might possibly look like and start to assemble certain artifacts that exist in the real world that might go into construct this. And like I said, I've just come to realize that that commons probably won't ever exist, but it's still an interesting framing device to group a load of things together. Um, this is uh, the website I've just started, actually. I'm going to be working on it as well while I'm here over the next day or two. I launched it last week. And perhaps one of the, the more interesting outcomes of this, uh, this way of thinking, um, and ex I'll explain why as I go on, um, and it's just a collection of data of, of stuff that is happening that's kind of significant and interesting in terms of uh, the things that are being spoken about and things that are being talked about in contemporary society. So things like um, uh, the Keeling curve, which is the top stat, the price of bitcoins, uh, energy usage, things like that, sea level heights. There's a couple of, lots of other data I've got to, to add on here. Um, that I'm going to be doing over, over the next few weeks. But it, it, it's interesting as a way of thinking about the language that, uh, you know, Google, again, to use Google, but you replace with whoever is constructed for us to talk about things is primarily in data. It's primarily in numbers and the sharing of data. And so I said, well, if we're going to be talked to as if we're data and talked to with data, then let's use it and point it back and construct some sort of narrative. So it's very early days, but I thought I'd, I'd share it with you anyway. Um, so uh, I'm going to start in the 60s, which is where the essay started as well. It's a good place to start. Um, they were very significant. How many, uh, how many designers are there, actually, just so I know how to sort of angle this talk? Well, there's not many of you, right? So like four or five of you, okay. Um, so design in the 60s was incredibly significant. Modernist design was, was hugely significant to um, the way the world is now. It was the first time that design became a sort of desirable, uh, that the 
an industry for producing desirable objects, not just practical objects. And that was down to advances in manufacturing and technology and distribution networks and the cheapening of materials, a lot of the technological advances that came out of the Second World War. Um, and, and something like this, which is uh, perhaps one of the most famous Eames adverts of the time, it, it kind of characterizes that whole period, you know, very beautiful, very aesthetic, um, and, and very advanced, actually, for the time. The kind of processes they were using in the construction of these designs were really quite significant. At the same time, around the other side of the world, in 1968, uh, you had, oh, it's 1969, sorry, isn't it? You had um, Super Studio, who were part of a group of designers called the Italian Radicals, who were perhaps the first critical designers, really. Um, and they created this very famous uh, proposal called uh, the Continuous Monument, and you've probably seen uh, before. And the point of this was, to, was that the, the Italian radicals saw design and architecture as a, as a nullifying, homogenizing practice, not one of freedom and liberation and, and empowerment, but one that actually sort of oppressed people and exploited them. Um, so they proposed this monument that would encircle the world and, and had no sort of cultural or, or historical identity. It was just a sort of blank block canvas that everyone would be forced to live with every day. Um, Adolfo Natalini said, uh, uh, reflecting on it, if architecture is merely the codifying a bourgeois model of ownership and society, then we must reject architecture. If architecture and town planning is merely the formalization of present unjust social divisions, then we must reject town planning and its cities. Until all design activities are aimed towards meeting primary needs, until then design must disappear. We can live without architecture. It's kind of childish, but remember this is the 60s. This is just the beginning of design. If, if, if a student of mine did this now, I'd probably throw him off a bridge. But in the 60s, it was really a very significant statement to make. Um, and the other important thing about this monument, which is really what I'm taking away from it, is the legibility of it. Um, the fact that it was, it was designed, the way they designed it is they've designed it to be very, it's right, constructed of right angles, it's very squared off, you can see it from everywhere, it's very noticeable, uh, it's divided into these grid structures and people who live on it are assigned a certain section. And that's a kind of very sophisticated comment about the, the state of the world as it was then, which was the, the, the age of the super state, the age of massive bureaucracy and technocracy that was taking over the world in the middle of the Cold War, of, of huge interventions, uh, and, and the, the, the readability of the world. And so legibility is one of the things that I've noticed uh, are very important today, and I'm sort of going to span up on this a bit and, and come into design conflict territories hugely, which is an introduction to the first section of this talk called Divide and Quantify. Come on, you can do it. There you go. Right, so James C. Scott, Seeing Like a State. Who's read it? Hands up. Yeah, everyone should read this book. It's probably it's one of the most amazing books as spe in in uh, in recent modern times. Uh, the whole, he, this is the whole premise of it: the utopian, imminent, and continually frustrated goal of the modern state is to reduce the chaotic, disorderly, constantly changing social reality beneath it to something more closely resembling the administrative grid of its observations. And he points out that basically the project of the state, and again, you can use any large hierarchy here as well because it applies to corporations and, and it's sort of any large governing body is in a three-stage process of how they read the world. The first stage is to, to filter what you need from the world. The second stage is to abstract it. And the third stage is to then reform the world in that image of the abstraction you've created. Uh, a friend of mine calls this a very small idea, but with a very big shadow. And it's, it's really interesting when you start to think about everything else and how this starts to apply. Um, the example that James C. Scott uses is uh, German forestry in the late 18th century. Um, at the time, uh, the gathering of lumber and timber for, for construction projects in a country that was trying to industrialize was highly, highly inefficient. Um, and so a, a, a science of forestry management was begun where there was a way of trying to, instead of having this chaotic forest as we see on the left where everything's just randomly assembled, it's kind of unreadable, it's illegible, it's impossible to know how much you're going to gain from this or, or who's going to cut what or how it's going to be done and at what time, you order it as done on the right into a plantation forest. You allow each tree the exact amount of room it needs to grow. You can divide them into rows so you know when to cut them down and when to let them grow. You can very quickly administer and control this environment that was originally chaotic. And it was an excellent idea and it worked really well for the first few yields. The problem, of course, was that after two or three yields, biodiversity in the forest was completely destroyed and nothing would ever grow there again, which was something they hadn't foreseen. And James C. Scott uses this as a metaphor for that project across all, sta all scales. The, the ordering of the world into a legible format will ultimately undermine it and sort of try it, will, will break it. It's a similar argument to the old um, Borgesian map and the territory. 
Also, German forestry, interestingly, is where we get the word sustainable from. Um, and they didn't mean sustainable as in environmentally friendly. They meant it as in repetitive and could be done over and over again. Um, so then you, you, you go forward a bit and you end up with uh, the sort of Corbusier master plan of the 30s. Paris is, you know, the great catnip of city planners. Um, and Corbusier, when he was designing his sort of master plans for Paris in, uh, in, the, in the 20s and 30s, this was the last one, the Radiant City, uh, worshipped the machine the, the philosophy of the machine, of Taylorism, of Fordism, if the machine was so perfect and functioned so seamlessly and effortlessly that it, you know, if it broke, you could identify which part broke and replace it, why couldn't society function in the same way? And so he designed um, these machines for living in, uh, which is a way of thinking that, that didn't last, it didn't take off. You know, Prisons are very resistant to this kind of change, naturally, and there were only a couple of examples of these kind of projects really going forwards, but it's a, it's a mentality that permeated upwards. Oh, this is great, actually. I'll put this in. You know this film, right? Everyone knows this film. You must do. So this is Tati's excellent... Uh, oh, the volume's not very good. Tati's excellent critique of, of that mentality as it still was going in, in Paris in the 60s. Um, you can dissect this film infinitely to find out everything that was, he was thinking of, even the fact that people walk at right angles all the time. Half the cast are actually cardboard cutouts and not real people. Um, unfortunately, actually, I might be because I've got it on silent. Let me just see it. No. Anyway, there's a great bit in a minute where he introduces the technocrat, who is one of the main characters. President, director general, son chauffeur, technocrat. The technocrat was a very key feature of, of his critique. The guy who ordered things, who organized things, who made it legible, and who did all the filing and things like that. And this this vision of Paris he had was his nightmare vision of this this sort of legibility takeover of, of a, what is essentially a very chaotic and vibrant city. And he was the soft end of this period's backlash against mass bureaucracies. Uh, 1968 was an incredibly uh, important year politically. It's seen as a real turning point in terms of the, the political dialogues we have and the commons that we have. Um, the protests at the time were interesting. I'm going to read a, a quote from David Graeber, who's a, who's a theoretician. Um, until 1968, most world revolutions really just introduced practical refinements and expanded franchise, universal primary education, the welfare state. The world revolution of 1968, in contrast, was a rebellion against bureaucracy. As a result, in most cases, the rebels didn't even try to take over the apparatus of the state. They saw the apparatus itself as a problem. So much of the rebellion and, and sort of the rioting and protesting of that period wasn't so much just about... Um, uh, uh, rights and the, and the gaining of privilege and things like that, but it was actually about breaking down the divides that had been imposed, things like gender, race, class, political ideology, where you belonged, and say, seeing those as, as uh, sort of facile lies that were put, put upon the world by these super states that existed at the time, um, which is why you ended up with hippies next to neo-libertarians, next to socialists, all protesting essentially against this huge system. Um, what's the next slide? Hang on. It gets sticky on videos. Yeah, all right. So you go forward 80 years from Kubuzia and you end up with the sort of smart city vision, the sort of ever prevalent uh, rendering that you find in every sort of architecture report. And these are essentially just an update of the early master planners. It's, it's the same mentality carried forward. The philosophy, the philosophy of the machine is replaced by the philosophy of data. If data functions so seamlessly and effortlessly and, you know, is so readable and understandable, aren't people just the same as data? In the same way that Cabuzier imagined that all people were basically machines, the, the sort of Cthulhu mythos of big data has now expanded into whole master plans for cities in the middle of the Amazon and things like that and in the uninhabitable deserts of the, of the Arabian Peninsula. But data is, is just another abstract of reality. It's a much more detailed, higher resolution abstract of reality, but it is an abstract and it is no basis basis for a civilization at all. Um, let's move forward again. It's going to get sticky, isn't it? It's also interesting, based on what Neil said, these renderings never feature people, like ever, ever feature people. Because um, they don't figure people in. Keller Easterling, I'm just going to do this while it's not changing the slide. Keller Easterling, who's a wonderful theoretician, has a great uh, quote about... Um, them being just the, the physicalization of software that's worth looking into. I've got a Jane Jacobs quote as well. Um, a city cannot be a work of art in relation to the inclusiveness and literally endless intricacy of life. Art is arbitrary, symbolic, and abstracted. That is its value and the source of its own kind of order and coherence. The results of such profound confusion between art and life are neither life nor art. They are taxidermy. 
In its place, taxidermy can be a useful and decent craft. However, it goes too far when the specimens put on display are exhibitions of dead stuffed cities. And she's reflecting back here across this history of master plans from Hausmanization to Le Cubusier and so on and so forth. They are just the sort of taxidermied utopias of these sort of great high modernist minds. And we can look at uh, the plan for the smart city in this data-driven environment that we're constantly being peddled in a very similar light. Um, and also the other thing about taxidermy is a, a, an interesting reference to the black box, the idea of Latour's black box. Um, Bruno, who des he describes it as uh, the way scientific and technical work is made invisible by its own success. When a machine runs efficiently, when a matter of fact is settled, one need focus only on its inputs and outputs and not on its internal complexity. Thus, paradoxically, the more science and technology succeed, the more opaque they become. It's wordy, but if you look, for instance, you compare an iPod and a gramophone, you could look at a gramophone for a few hours, maybe a day, and you would figure out how it works. You could just guess what the various affordances and mechanics were. You wouldn't be able to build one, but you could certainly understand it. The same cannot be said of an iPod. And so paradoxically, we're approaching this age where the objects we own and the things we live with are becoming more and more illegible to us, but granting greater and greater legibility to the people who create them. This is fine on the scale of iPods, but then when it goes up to sort of whole visions of the future as produced by Microsoft, for instance, I don't know if this is going to play. Let's just give it a shot. Yeah, no, yeah, it is. Um, this sort of like flat-packed, hollow, peop again, this might as well be peopleless. The pr people here are just props for the technology. We don't understand how this technology works or how it's supposed to work, but we're willing to buy into it. If you look at the great sort of uh, technology product advertisement campaigns of the 60s, you see that half of them are dedicated to explaining how this amazing new telephone network or whatever it is will function and what it's made of and how it will work and how much it will cost. This stuff is all hidden from view. We're presented the seamless front. And again, that gets even more problematic if it's scaled up to an entire civilizational way of thinking about things where a giant communications black box is installed over the entire world through which everything we do or say is filtered. Um, I'm going to, before closing off this section, reference James C. Scott again and again. I hugely recommend seeing Like a State. The Economic Plan Survey Map, a record of ownership, forest management plan, classification of ethnicity, passbook, arrest record, a map of, of political boundaries, acquire their force from the fact that these synoptic data points are the points of departure for reality as state officials apprehend and shape it. In dictatorial settings where there is no effective way to assert another reality, fictitious facts on paper can often be made eventually to prevail on the ground because it is on behalf of such pieces of paper that police and army are deployed. It is a massive problem if the civilization that abstracts the world has the ability to use an army against you, is basically what he's trying to say. Um, and when we look at something like the NSA revelations and we look at this massive spying system and the abstract of the world that they've constructed uh, around basically keywords and uh, you know, facial recognition software, that, is that the basis in which to use force against your own people, potentially, or against other people has actually been demonstrated? Um, oh, yeah, this is great. This doesn't really fit in entirely, but this is also another really great insert, uh, uh, instance of legibility gone wrong. Um, Think about it like this. In the book of Genesis, God is the ultimate programmer, creating all of existence in a monster six-day hackathon. Uh, it's great. As someone who treats uh, the entirety of the universe as a program just has, a, has a, some sort of thing going on here. Also, the fact that he mentions Robert Moses, who is a renowned sort of racist social engineer, is a, sort of a great leader of this stuff. Um, so the next stage is uh, clouded geographies, and this is really about how the technology infrastructure, the network, fit physically over the geography of the Earth, and how there's a, there's a reliance between physicality and networks, and how the two things interconnect heavily. Going back to the NSA, there's been an ongoing campaign, a series of campaigns since the revelations to remove uh, water from the NSA data centers, the simple fact being that they require huge amounts of water to cool their servers, and if you take away the water, it doesn't function. It's an interesting loophole, and it exposes exactly how reliant on the physical infrastructure of the state this operation is, and on the actual resources of the Earth this operation is. It doesn't exist in a bubble. It's fully tied in. And it does a great thing of dismissing the myth of digital dualism, that there is somehow a physical and a digital world that are, are separate, and you can dive into one and dive into another. They're entirely and in, in, intractably connected. Um, uh, equally, uh, uh, these guys managed to cut off the internet to Egypt, by just cutting through the cable. 
that's how easy it is. There's a, there's a cable that runs into Egypt, and during the revolution, they cut it off. Uh, in Armenia, a few years earlier, um, a 75-year-old Georgian woman who was scrounging for copper cut off all the, uh, all the internet to Armenia as well. There's a physical, heavy infrastructure here that is not the cloud or pervasive computing. is actually weighted by the laws of physics and the geography of the Earth and things like that. Um, and this, in, in uh, the American context, is where the internet comes to New York. This is the building through which the overseas fiber optic cables surface in New York. It's 60 Hudson Street. There's so many stories about this place as far as what that means. The property prices on Wall Street are hugely influenced by proximity to this building because of the simple fact that the closer you are, the faster your internet connection is. Things like that. It, it, it's an incredible story, and you can actually listen photographs that like, have been taken offline now due to the threat of terrorism of the actual cable coming up from, like, between some air conditioners in the basement of this building. It's brilliant. Um, so, so this is a this is a huge. The, the idea of the stack is a huge part of this. Stacktivism is a, an interesting kind of movement coming out of London. Um, that's been going for a year or so, started much on the same basis as this project on, on a blog post, um, which basically looks to analyze the connections between the layers of technical and, and, and physical geography. Um, this is Jay Springett's map, which he nicknames Ways Not to Die, where he points out that there are basically six ways you can die, all of which are reliant on a physical and technical infrastructure, and all of which are owned by corporations or states who then perform this abstract on you. Um, and perhaps we should then explore a little bit what this idea of the stack uh, means. I don't necessarily fully believe it, but it's certainly interesting to think about. Uh, ben Bratton was perhaps the originator of the term the stack. He's currently working on a book which was supposed to be out two years ago, which maybe will come out at some point. Um, and he says, instead of viewing the various scales of emergent ubiquitous computing technologies as a haphazard collection of individual processes, devices, and standards, so, for example, RFID, cloud storage, augmented reality, smart cities, and conflict minerals. Interesting conflict minerals rather than another device. Um, it is more illuminating to model them as components of a larger comprehensive meta-technology. Viewing these individual things as, as, as unique and somehow, again, separate and in bubbles is false, is what he's saying. They're part of this massive global computing system. Um, the stack, is a planetary, the stack is a planetary scale com computation understood as a megastructure. At the scale of planetary com computation, the stack is uh, comprised of seven interdependent layers. Earth, cloud, city, network, address, interface, user. In this, it is an attempt to co conceive the technical and geopolitical structures of planetary computation as a totality. So not only do they encircle the planet in, in the, in the uh, network sense of going around, but there's also several layers here, from the layer that's in your pocket, which is your device, or in your eyes, in fact, right up to the sort of global level of, you know, uh, currency markets or, or fiber optic cables. Um, and then the geopolitics of this become really interesting, how that works politically. Examples of the geopolitics of the cloud might range from anonymous server routers from Egypt, the Google-China conflict, the ITU United Nations governance controversies, uh, anonymous going up against Mexican drug cartels, WikiLeaks, the Facebook, Twitter, YouTube stack in Cairo, Tor users building on the Amazon cloud, uh, MPLS level two dark fiber networks connected uh, trading floor centers for optimal position to uh, trading floors gaming the speed of light, the microeconomics of transcontinental bandwidth. There's a huge amount. These are all conflicts. These are all conflicts that happen at different scales, often invisible, often across several layers, often in different places in the world, often at different times. And so the view of politics is a very uh, sedentary, squared off, very simple two-dimensional battle is no longer applicable when we're talking on this sort of multi-dimensional scale. Go on. Yeah. So visualizing this then becomes really interesting. This is... Um, uh, the photo that won press photo of the year last year. It's a really, really amazing shot, but not for the, the f photographic qualities, but because of what it shows. And what it shows is uh, Somali immigrants to Djibouti standing on the coast of the city trying to get cell network coverage from Somalia because it's cheaper than it is in Djibouti. Uh, this is a practice uh, Julian Oliver refers to as border bumping. They refer to them as catches in the photograph. But the point is that they are, they are revealing to us the, both the financial, technical, and legal invisible infrastructures that surround this very small beach in Africa. Right? The fact that they have to actually go and do this physical movement in order to engage with another part of the network 
in, indicates how these things are tied and how they interrelate and how, for instance, you know, if the state decided to blockade the beach, they would no longer have access to that network. They would no longer have access to the legal frameworks that, that exist there because, ostensibly, with Somalia cell networks, anything you do on that network happens in Somalia and not in Djibouti. There's so many implications and things that come off this photo. It deservedly won the prize. Um, and then, of course, it goes the other way. So the big tech companies love a physical territory, or, or there's sort of encroaching out recently into physical territory, which has been really interesting. Um, Larry Page here uh, giving away Google's desire for a country by mistake at a press conference, which he later really quickly retracted, but nonetheless kind of displayed what is part of a huge, large inheritance of Randian neoliberal uh, sort of territory mongering on the part of the major tech corporations. Um, Blue Seed and SpaceX, I think one of them's, they're both PayPal mafia, one's Elon Musk, you know, we're going to colonize the moon or we're going to go out to the sea and have some sort of tax haven, some sort of pirate vessel on which we'll live and we won't have to listen to the state anymore. All imply that these companies are now running up against the problems of not having physical territory of their own. They've dominated the network, the network is theirs, but they actually now need land in which to set up their sort of Mordor-like empire, perhaps. I don't know, maybe. A giant eye? Who knows? Um, and the need for extra statecraft, again, I reference Kelly Sterling. I'd love to quote her, but she, she reads so much better. Um, this idea of sort of the return of the pirate state, the city state, special economic zones. Land is becoming important again because we've got massive population. We need these spaces to live in. That's a huge part of the territory aspect of design conflict territories. Um, and, of course, these things have predicted knock-on effects. So San Francisco at the moment is currently being systematically destroyed by the tech industry, um, where some old law from the 70s that no one has used has been brought back from the dead to uh, evict people so that property prices can be allowed to inflate for the tech executives who are moving in. Um, and again, we can think here of Jane Jacobs' reference to taxidermy. What, you know, you imagine a future at San Francisco in 20 years where all that's left is the image of San Francisco and no one can actually afford to live there, but nonetheless, the lifestyle remains. Um, and of course, this has predictable results for the residents who, uh, and what's interesting about this, I don't know how much, this protest was very interesting because it wasn't a protest against Google and it wasn't a protest against the property prices. It was against the hijacking of the bus lanes. So it was against, the, a, a private corporation hijacking public infrastructure for their gain. And that was very interesting because you do have, you know, and there's so much stuff about corporate and state, um, state entities now going up against each other, people referencing Google as the world's first, the world's biggest super state. But to actually now be arguing over the sort of the, uh, the, the minutiae of public infrastructure who can use the bus lanes at what time is, is just really interesting. That's now happening on that scale and the corporate weight is, is such that that's allowed to occur. What's next? So, territories, right, so conflict territories, this is the, the part that becomes interesting then is what happens to your political agency when these kind of phenomena exist, when this interplay between network, territory, and, and legal frameworks comes into play? Uh, this was London two days ago, um, and I think mo a lot of Europe did this. They had taxis sitting in. The media reported it as protests against Uber. It wasn't just protests against Uber. There were lots of things here about the way that uh, London's transport infrastructure is being managed or mismanaged. But what was interesting is that it, the, the highlight is this idea of Uber, this idea that the, the sharing economy is taking away this sort of the great London taxi driver, which has this, you know, they have to study the knowledge. It's, it's, a, it's a huge career move. It requires a lot of extensive training and things like that. But as a sort of like, if you look at this through the window of traditional protest movements, seizing the means of production where the taxi drivers have seized the roads as the original, as the means for production for, for their own sort of transport infrastructure and for their own businesses. Um, and this is a, a, a form, how do you protest against an app? And this is an, an, an inelegant way of doing it, but it's the way they've chosen to do it, and it's very visual. One of the unfortunate backlashes of this is that Uber's, um, Uber's uh, demand went up like, 250% on the day because none of the taxi drivers were working. So, <laughs> and this is another really example of, of particularly tying into the legal framework. This, uh, this is a Canadian man called uh, Peter von Tiesenhausen, probably pronouncing that wrong, who um, a gas company wanted to run a gas pipe underneath his land. He, owned, he owns a huge... Um, a huge plot of land somewhere in the middle of Canada. Um, and it, he tried to protest it and he tried to fight it and they would remunerate him for $200 per acre because that was what it was worth in loss of crops and things like that. Um, and so he put up with it for a bit and then he decided to become a land artist. And he went around his 
plot around his acreage, and he just put down loads of land art. And it's not very good land art. You can see that it's a bit lackluster. That might just be the rain, though. But suddenly, the value of that land per acre went up to $600,000, and he copyrighted the top six inches of soil, which is just... It made it impossible for them to then put in the pipeline because it was too expensive. The legal hurdles jumped up significantly. He also ingeniously started charging $500 an hour for his time as a consultant to the company. So every time they rang his door, he gave them an invoice, which was really nice. But using those, using those weapons, which were well, not weapons, using those, those ideas and those frameworks, which were theoretically meant to empower people like that anyway, against the people who were trying to abuse them for their own aim and have the greater levies, the, great, the, the, the barriers to access to that legal framework are much less for a massive gas corporation because they have teams of lawyers and huge disposable income, but for him, he just had his land and the ability to make art on it. So there's a thing about sort of legal hacking that's nascent in the design conflict territory space. Um, and, and then also pop culture plays a massively important role. Um, CV Dazzle makeup, Adam Harvey's great invention, um, was a, a way of disguising your face so that facial recognition software wouldn't be able to spot it. This has now permeated pop culture where teen girls on YouTube are uh, doing tutorials on how to dazzle makeup yourself. I think Berlin has a dazzle makeup party every month where people gather by sort of some sort of warehouse and, and do each other's makeup and then wander around the town and go to clubs and things with it. And this is now a part of pop culture. It's, it's you, again, using a, a certain weapon, a certain hack, against software, yet these teenage girls would in no way be able to take down a giant software company that was using surveillance techniques, but they can spread this idea of uh, um, you know, hacks and things you can do yourself to stop it. And it's done purely in this, in this parlance, in this, in this wording of makeup videos that are so present on YouTube. Um, and also the mosquito alarm is another good one, the one we mentioned briefly, um, of, of, uh, of a high-pitched noise to, to, to dissuade teenagers from gathering that adults can't hear, and then the teenagers sort of hijacking that and using it against the adults themselves. Um, so, uh, reflecting on 1968 in the 70s, Albert Hirschman, who is a his, historian and, and anthropologist and theorist, wrote... Uh, a treatise called Exit Voice Loyalty. And he basically said that there are, there are three fundamental options you have if you're unhappy with your, the political situation or wherever you are. Um, you can exit, so you can run away and go somewhere else. You can voice, which is uh, to protest. Or you can remain loyal. Um, the last one is neglect, which is you know, the Hobson's choice, the choice not to make a choice, the choice not to do anything. The problem is that all these things after the 60s were very difficult to do. Exit's very hard because there aren't many places you can go now. The world is largely securitized and locked down and homogenized. Voice is very difficult um, for reasons I'll explain. And loyalty is you know, kind of soulless and lusterly. Um, so this is potentially what loyalty do. Again, I'm going to bang Microsoft around a bit. You know, they're kind of buying into the vision that you're presented, buying into uh, the sort of status quo of, of the system that you're, you may fundamentally be unhappy with. Um, I dragged this video out from the archives because it's, it's really great as far as sort of Microsoft's vision of the future home is this perfect mixed race couple where the wife stays at home and the man goes to work and he's an engineer and stuff is dragged and dropped and it's all very, it's all very soulless. It's kind of exciting. But that's kind of potentially what loyalty looks like. You know, this, this buying into that dream, that utopia, the, the, the unrealizable fiction. Um, go on. You know, and this is what voice looks like now. Uh, David Graeber, who I mentioned earlier, goes on to talk about how uh, the greatest fear post-1968 of most states and corporations was protest, greater than anything else. And so as many precautions are put in place to prevent it being effective as possible, um, currently in London, uh, uh, We've just bought three water cannons. You know, it's huge expense when other things could be done because pro because they're, they're scared of riots in the summer because uh, of fuel prices and things like that, potentially. I don't know. Um, and then also we have the rise of things like clicktivism and slacktivism, which are these terms for just sort of idly signing up to Facebook petitions. Um, in 2009, a researcher at the University of Copenhagen um, started a Facebook page to stop the demolition of a public monument, and within two weeks had 20, 27,000 uh, likes and 27,000 people signed this petition. The, the plan never existed. No one was ever going to knock down a monument. But the point is he was, he was pointing out how viscerally satisfying that is to people, but largely how ineffective it is, how easy it is to ignore as a, as a sort of way of, of protest. And again, talking about the land artist earlier, levies such as 
access to lawyers, access to legal knowledge, things like that, prevent you from doing effective things, Occupy potentially being a good exception where they actually handed out legal advice to everyone taking part as a way to prepare them for some of the side effects of what might happen. Um, and this is what Exit used to look like. These are the Koreshans. They're a lovely bunch. They thought that um, the world was inverse and we all lived on the inside of a sphere. Um, and everyone thought they were mad. So they said, you know, fine, we'll go and start our own little cult and we'll go and do it over there down the road. And they did. And they were very popular. And I think they had like 200 members at the, at the height of their, their, their success. And that was perhaps the last time that you could really do that. You could really say, I have a mad belief. I have a mad idea. And I'm going to go and found a society on those principles. And we'll try, we'll try again and see what happens. Um, incidentally, they did prove that the world was um, inverted, which was interesting. They, they built a giant ruler um, and said it's perfectly straight. And so if it goes into the ground, then the world's inverted. If it goes out from the ground, then um, it's, we're living on the outside and everyone else was right. And, of course, they found that it went into the ground because, you know, if you build it, they will come. Um, and so last, so what, what is the potential for, for exit or voice or loyalty? And that's where I get onto the thing I've been writing about more and more recently is this idea of technology as a territory, a territory in the sense of a commons, of a place, of a space to occupy, to position yourself, to present yourself from. Um, and potentially it's there that we might find a, a new commons. Um, Various examples of this, Tor's Silk Road, very famous example of extra statecraft, executed brilliantly, um, a, a massive online drugs operation by a, a guy called Dread Pirate Roberts, I can't remember his real name, um, made billions of dollars on this, and he ran it from uh, Wi-Fi in San Francisco public libraries. So as far as like seizing public infrastructure to create an entire extra state practice goes, a really, you know, not a, not a, a pretty nefarious example, but a pretty, a pretty, Excellent one, and compared to uh, you know the, the seasteading and sort of extraterritorial dreams of uh, Silicon Valley, a real actual success in, in the practice of extra statecraft, a real territory he constructed for himself. Um, the Athens Wireless Metropolitan Network, which I adore and, and love infinitely, is um, a, a wireless mesh network uh, constructed over Athens in uh, following the, the riots there, post austerity measures, 2009-2010. Uh, the great thing about a mesh network, for those that don't know, is there's no central hub, so there's no way to cut off the internet to these people. It is completely spread out over all the different nodes, over your own computer, over whoever's connected. Um, they constructed their own entire alternate internet. Basically, the government was censoring the internet coming in. It was cutting off Twitter and Facebook and things like that. It was reading emails that were being sent back and forth between certain activists that were trying to, to stop the government. And... Um, so they, they built an entire alternate infrastructure. They effectively constructed a brand new digital territory in which to function. Um, and as well as sort of organizing protests and things, it, it, it has a social network. You can share videos. It's got a search engine. Um, it connects to the dark net. Um, is this a smart city is a good question that I've been asked about this before. And I think it is. I think it's a genuine case of a, a participatory run uh, city where people are enabled by the technology they use. Um, that's one of the nodes. That's the... Uh, the, uh, the image I showed at the beginning. And they're very free. It's, it's, it's well-found technology. You can set up a node in a day. You just plug in a Wi-Fi router to your computer, basically. Um, they use radio waves and radio antennas then to blast that off, and you just hook it up to your radio antenna. This uh, guy, very kindly, I had a long conversation with him about it, and he was very... He basically sold me on it. It was brilliant. Uh, come on, you can do that. Um, and Occupy Here, which is another really great example of this. Um, this has just been released. This is uh, some of the guys from Occupy and some guys from Anonymous constructed a mesh network uh, a device you can buy and just plug into any device you like, and so you can connect to other other people who might have one. A friend of mine is currently flying one of these routers on a giant balloon floating over Peckham in South London. Um, it's just a really good idea, and it's just there. It's a giant black weather balloon that just, well, not a weather balloon, but a giant black helium balloon with a router on it that anyone can connect to and talk to each other on. Uh, and then things like MCOPA, which isn't necessarily a network technology, but has this huge potential to really change the way that dependence on the stack works. Um, MCOPA is a system for distributed photovoltaics in places that don't have um, hardwired electrical access um, and access to power and things like that. And that's really good, and it's great because at the moment, uh, places like in Kenya and stuff where this, this technology is coming out of, you burn kerosene, which is highly damaging and poisonous. But... It has huge potential in the simple fact that these communities now grow up without having ever any dependence on corporations or states. They are completely independent in terms of that map of ways not to die. They have control over that. They have access to their own source of power, at least for now. 
Um, and it's hugely popular. There's something like 220,000 units out there. It's kind of crazy. And then, of course, the informal economy is another distributed invisible territory. Um, this is called international remittance, which is basically um, economic speak for people who send their money back home. Um, and it's, 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 it's a, it's, you can see from the, the graph, it's about three times the size of the official monetary sort of uh, budgetary developmental aid uh, remits of different countries and things like that. Um, and, and is an invisible flow of money that is hugely influential and implies a huge a lot about the invisible networks that, again, aren't tracked and aren't legible to the state and, and a potential for deconcentration of wealth as well. So uh, I'm going to finish here. So a design conflict territory was a proposal, but was an impossible proposal, and so is a thing that can never properly exist, but is certainly a way of thinking about the alternative, the imaginable alternatives, as, as a friend of mine likes to say, around which you can hook ideas for technologies, for design, for social structures, and so on and so forth. And there are a couple of things to remember. All this stuff will be forgotten in 20 years. No one will ever remember it. It'll go on the garbage heap of history with everything else, and there'll be new stuff that'll be happening. And I just think, and I suppose to, to the people who are taking part in this symposium, I would say to think more systematically and holistically about the things you're engaging with. Think critically about what the implications of putting a screen in a space are, what the implications of connecting certain devices are, what they mean in terms of legal frameworks, in terms of political frameworks, and what the wider sort of ramifications of those might be in 20 years' time. Thank you very much. So thank you. Are there any questions? I suppose it must be. That's lunch. Just go to lunch. <laughs> <laughs> no, you won't escape the questions. <laughs> Anyone? Really? That's all right, I don't mind. Well, maybe it was just all clear and complete. Like, maybe it was the exact opposite. <laughs> like. <laughs> <laughs> good. Uh, how do you see the stack relating to the spectacle um, in terms of Guy Debord's kind of vision of the, the society of the spectacle as an interpretation of capitalism? I don't, I don't know. I've never read Society of the Spectacle, I'm okay. totally honest with you. D describe that end of it and I'll see what I can do. Okay. Uh, I, I think he, he, he sort of talks about um, 1960s uh, capitalism as, as a thing that... Um, uses the uh, culture of the day, um, particularly broadcast culture, I suppose, mm. cinema, advertising, um, as a means to present people with a spectacle. Um, and, and I suppose it's a mode of society that, um, that very much places citizens as spectators to right. the action. Um, and, uh, yes, yeah, so mass distribution, broadcast, well, it, as a means it, to render people... Passive yeah. spectators. I mean, in that case, it's uh, it's uh, it comes back to the black box again, like the idea of a sort of planetary wide black box, such as the NSA or, or I don't know anything really. There's so many of them. Google's data gathering operation. Um, the great phrase that people like to throw around in futurist circles is, you know, what is Google doing in there? They appear to be gathering all these robotics technologies and things together, and it's almost like we're presented with the shiny side of that, the spectacle, you know, the, the sort of the excellent seamless devices and the, the, the services that are wonderful, and yet the, the meaning of that is hidden behind that spectacle, I guess. I don't know if that relates. And so the stack is, is the invisible black box behind the sort of shininess of technology. Yeah, yeah. It seems, for what, it's kind of the first time I've encountered it really, but it seems to place a bit more emphasis on uh, this kind of materialism of the infrastructure as well. Oh, as yeah, Keller stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the materials of the infrastructure are really uh, interesting, simply thinking about um, the values of the metals that are involved, the things like the internet, that take, the internet takes up something like 4% of global energy demand, stuff like that. When you start to see it in those terms, it does become a very... Uh, a weak and physical, tangible thing. Um, Keller's stuff, particularly around extra statecraft and access to resources and stuff, is, is really interesting in terms of that, such as uh, interplanetary mining propositions, which are being taken deadly seriously because the stack is relies on things like rare earth elements to build devices. And so if a load of guys say, we're going to send up some rockets with mining equipment to asteroids, everyone goes, actually, that's a really good idea. That we should definitely do that. So there's a reliance on that, that scale of madness. That, that needs the stack to function. <laughs>